All right, Matthias, welcome on the show. Thank you, Anna. Good to be here, Teza. Yeah. Uh, thank you again for you know giving up the time to come and you know, speak on about your research and your recent works. So one of the things I really want to talk about is you write extensively about human rights and the effects it has, you know, on everyday life. But in recent times, especially you know what's happening around the world now, a major incident is uh, the Uyghur people. I think I'm pronouncing that wrong, but it's the minority in China. How, what, how in your perspective should we react to this? And how should governments or you know, policymakers react to this? Because China is a superpower in the major economic force. So what's your thoughts on this? Well, let me uh, uh, first say uh, on, on this one. Uh, so as you're talking about human rights and uh, about the human rights movement, uh, one always refers back thereby to the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights that we get in, uh, in uh, 19, uh, 1948, uh, which is really one of the great accomplishments of uh, humankind that we get a document like that, that in 30 articles lists a number of entitlements and provisions that everybody uh, should have uh, and for whose realization really everybody is responsible especially but not only governments um, now of course uh, this is a standard it's an aspirational standard in many ways uh, a legal standard um, but uh, governments uh, are not always adhe adhering to that standard and often you know have reasons of their own to try to, to deviate from them. Uh, and then it is the responsibility of the rest of us uh, to try to hold them account, right? And mm -hmm. uh, that can mean very different things for, for different uh, actors. So for journalists, for example, uh, human rights NGOs, it will mean to actually do high quality reporting so that we understand what's going on. Uh, for other governments and international organizations, it will mean to bring up the subject with China as much as possible and uh, try to uh, exert pressure on China in ways that seems promising. It is obviously uh, a, you know, a difficult thing to do in the case of a superpower that is not easily influenced, right? But mm. they, uh, in the human rights field, uh, the, the the slogan is always, uh, you know, we everybody should do what they can uh, and keep an eye on the ball, so that in uh, in the in the course of the time, there will be progress. Although it seems like maybe a simplistic, you know, uh, anecdote or generalization, but mm. don't you think that what's happening in China is, you know, a repeat of World War Two or the concentration camps and you know, Nazi Germany? Well, you know, historical comparisons, especially with uh, such extraordinary uh, occurrences uh, as the Jewish Holocaust and the Second World were always difficult uh, to make. Uh, clearly, there is a, uh, there is a systematic uh, violation against a subpopulation of China uh, exactly at what caliber we, I think, do not yet know. Um, but uh, I have never heard anybody assert that it was actually at the level of genocidal extermination of the whole people. I think this is not what, they, what the Chinese government has in mind. It wants, mm -hmm. them, it wants to co-opt them uh, to the mainstream Chinese ways, but uh, it does not have the same, the same ambitions for them, the same plans for them that Hitler had for the mm -hmm. Jewish people, but on some aspects of mm. you know, you know, uh, keeping them in these camps, mm. you know, without you know forcing them to do certain things or take mm. doing certain things to them, mm. don't you think that you know in this modern day, that is like you know unacceptable or yes, it yes. should not happen no, at no, all? No, of course, it's of course, like, of course. But well, that's a different question. Yeah. So of course it should not happen. Of mm. course it's unacceptable uh, and. Um, one way of one way of putting that uh, is in terms of human rights violations. It is mm -hmm. a, it is a human rights violation. It thereby is everybody's concern uh, that it not be uh, continued. Uh, and uh, you know, China uh, has really no serious excuse there because it definitely has the means of treating all of its citizens uh, decently. 
I'm just saying, you know, there is mm -hmm. there is gradations in the domain of evil and wrongdoing, yeah. right? So of course there is there is systematic violations uh, of a sort that one uh, that probably rise to the level of crimes that do that does rise to the level of crimes against humanity when you have systematic abuse of state power. That's the essence of crimes against humanity. Um, but crimes against humanity is a broader category and one particular kind of crime against humanity is genocide mm -hmm. when you're really targeting a particular uh, population for extermination because they are that kind of population. And I know what I'm saying here, all I was yeah, just saying sure, is, it's, sure. you know, mm -hmm. there's, again, mm -hmm. there's gradations in the domain of evil that one should yeah. keep up. And so, like, I was talking to my friend about this topic mm -hmm. the other day and, mm -hmm. you know, we were like saying, you know, what is the UN doing about this? You know, what are the, you know, these NGOs or, you know, UN being the universal, mm -hmm. you know, human rights authority, mm -hmm. what what are they doing? And what power do they have, essentially, of doing anything? Yeah. They can't, you know, force China to change anything. No, they, they, they really can't. Uh, and, uh, the, and there's a very specific reason why the United Nations cannot, uh, cannot force China to do anything. Uh, and the reason, that reason is... Uh, that the uh, governing organ of the United Nations is the Security Council, right? So the, uh, you know, so that's in a way the uh, essential point to appreciate about the United Nations that that group of countries is its essential organ, uh, and uh, the Security Council has uh, five permanent members. Uh, China is one of them, uh, and all of these permanent members have a, have a veto power over whatever the UN does, uh, and. That is reflecting the uh, the character of uh, world power in the global scenario we had after the Second World War when this organization was founded. Right. So in that mm -hmm. sense, in that sense, unfortunately, um, you know, and ideally we would not be the UN would not be organized like that. Ideally, the UN should be reformed to not create this kind of veto power. But unfortunately, that does mean that the UN, as such. Uh, can't really do anything uh, against China, which means that it has to be at the level of individual countries or organizations of other countries or, you know, of course, then human rights NGOs doing their share. So. Mm -hmm. And so you write about trade as being a force in, you know, mm -hmm. the whole, you know, world and human rights, etc. Mm -hmm. So China has a massive advantage or, you know, position in trade. Mm -hmm. And uh, New Zealand was one of the countries which mm -hmm. uh, signed a petition mm -hmm. with, I th I'm not sure how many other countries, more than 10, to sort of, you know, say, China, you know, calm down, don't stop doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, a lot of the other countries were fearful because, you know, if they did sign this, China would increase their tariffs or some mm -hmm. sort of trade mm -hmm. you know, incentive to not do, not sign this agreement. So how does that play in, you know, countries role of you know doing certain things or yeah yeah um you know uh, politics at the global level is uh, is of course very much uh, power politics uh, and at uh, uh and at this stage um you know with the united states basically abdicating his leadership in the or having abdicated his leadership in the human rights domain uh, it is very hard to find alliances of countries who would uh, take up human rights causes against a colossal players such as China. Um, that is an unfortunate fact about where the world is right now. Right. So um, under the Obama administration, there would have been at least a little bit more of a glimmer of hope uh, that the United States would have been a leader in an in a in a human rights alliance. I mean, even under Obama, this wasn't always reliably the case. So right now, uh, any kind of human rights uh, relating activities against uh, against China in particular could really only succeed if uh, the United States and the European Union together would be the ringleaders and bring other countries along also to basically minimize each other's damages in any kind of fallout right and that is uh, that is that is not the case right now so so that of course uh, simply limits what any one country you know what a place like new zealand which uh, which which has a very proud human rights record but mm. is also a small player in, mm. in global politics can can do for the time being right so you know unless everyone you know joins hands and mm. you know fights against the the big man nothing else would happen I, yeah, I mean, you know, different uh, in, in world politics at, uh, 
uh, at different times, uh, uh, different di there's different uh, there's different possibilities for bringing about change, right? And uh, and uh, right now, certain possibilities like that, those that depended on American leadership, are are not available. That's uh, that is an unfortunate fact about the world currently. Mm -hmm. So you're a philosopher, uh, you know, a professor of philosophy. Mm -hmm. How do you, uh, because in my sense, in my idea of philosophy, it's very theoretical, very mm -hmm. abstract. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you, uh, you know, takes these philosophical ideas and theories and somehow make it tangible, uh, applicable to the real world? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, of course, you, you are right. Uh, philosophy um, is a theoretical discipline or in any event, uh, uh, it has over over the over the centuries philosophy has become an academic field like others right and uh, and that includes that includes a certain professionalization it includes a certain uh, requirement for a mastery of material and styles of argumentation that uh, require a certain process of initiation so it's not it's not something that as a research discipline is uh, you know, is readily accessible, and you know, it's not. It's in that sense not different from other research fields like economics or computer science, where you also can't just kind of sit down and immediately grasp everything. Right? It requires mm -hmm. a learning process. Um, at the same time, um, philosophy uh, is not only a theoretical discipline. Uh, it is. Uh, it is ultimately a, a set of inquiries that that come from um, that originate from very basic questions that we have about the world, that we have about how we ought to act, that we have about how we ought to live together. And since those are the origins, it is a, it is a task for philosophers, at least as a, as a group, to bridge the, the, the theoretical rigor that as a discipline the field must have with the concern to actually say something about uh, problems in the, in the world, right? And so, uh, so we have to do the best we can uh, to to try to do both of these things, right? Just to contribute to philosophy as a research field, while also trying our best to uh, to deliver answers to urgent questions. So, what are some sort of problems you're working on that are philosophical, and you know, you're taking it from a theory and sort of applying it to the real world, or teaching your students? What could be some good examples of? So in my uh, in in my own thinking right now, I'm actually very much concerned with um, with technology. So I uh, think about artificial intelligence quite a bit, uh, and you know what the impact of artificial intelligence would be for the future of humanity, and uh, what it would mean for the idea of human rights, what I what human rights would would require, and even mean in the first place for. Uh, the kind of technological age that we are uh, that we're entering further and further, so that's uh, um, that's my own research field. Mm -hmm. So in terms of what what philosophy otherwise contributes to, in my teaching activity, so uh, back home uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, I teach a class on what we call practical ethics uh, for ongoing policymakers, and practical ethics is a is a version of ethics that starts with problems so with a complex scenario where uh, where a decision maker is stuck somewhere with some kind of problem about how to proceed uh, you know in 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 choices about legislation in you know making any kind of call about what policy to choose in in uh, in, uh, in light of obstacles and uh, and it's practical ethics because uh, moral considerations how to treat people, that's one kind of concern you have in a situation like that, but you have a lot of other, you know, political, economic, um, that kind of concern. And practical ethics is, is an attempt to figure out what is a what is the right way of treating people here, while also not losing sight of the fact that this all needs to be doable, implementable in a complicated world. Mm -hmm. So you say you, your primary research right now is to do with technology mm -hmm. and you know I've heard a lot of stories about you know AI and mm -hmm. how it could somehow mm -hmm. disrupt the way we live mm -hmm. but how much of that is uh, is very exaggerated mm -hmm. and how much of that is you know reality or could be mm -hmm. you know, 
Well, you know, it's uh, uh, it's uh, it's a little bit like uh, uh, it's a little bit like climate change, right? And uh, I mean, we we know there's a lot of change happening. Yeah. Uh, every every uh, few months, we are realizing that it's happening faster, um, you know, than we thought it would be. But nobody quite knows where it will be going and what kind of world it will create, right? So artificial intelligence. Um, you know, comes with uh, scenarios at the at the end of the at the end of the tunnel uh, that uh, are both uh, promising and truly scary. Namely, uh, the the potential the potential for so-called intelligence explosion, uh, also known as the singularity. So, uh, an intelligence explosion that would happen. So, suppose uh, so right right now. So, there's a distinction between special artificial intelligence and general artificial intelligence yeah, so uh, so artificial intelligence really is is a is a kind of mathematics that uh that has uh that has a way of um of improving its on, on basically doing its own learning right it's algorithms that can that can use data in order to improve themselves mm -hmm. right also known yeah, as yeah. machine learning right and rudimentary versions of that are present in all sorts of gadgets that that you that we are using already uh, you know from uh, you know, ex ex extremely e efficient versions of such gadgets that are also well known are um, chess playing and go playing uh, algorithms mm, um, yeah. you know from deep mind and uh, you know companies like that so but they're good at one particular thing just like your iphone you know uses versions of artificial intelligence and it's good at one thing or a few a few things so that's special artificial intelligence uh, and then we have general artificial intelligence which would be uh, the design of an overall algorithm so you know some some device with with software built in uh, that would actually approximate the perf the performance of human intelligence at a at a at a broad level, right? Which is, uh, which which is very different from these special cases because it's really it's applicable to a huge range of different scenarios, which is in a way what makes the human uh, brain so special mm -hmm. that it's yeah. uh, that it can do work in 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 very different fields and um, you know deep minds. Um, go and uh, chess playing uh, algorithms are not capable of doing anything else except play those games. And so, but so eventually we might succeed in in creating a general artificial intelligence that is smarter than us at a broad level of intelligent performance. And if we can do that, once we can do that, once we can perform, once we can produce uh, an, a general artificial intelligence like that chances are that it will be able to produce something that it is smarter than it because you know yeah, the, yeah. and and then you know so it does that right and then you have artificial intelligence general artificial intelligence of the second generation which might come relatively quickly after the first but then that second generation will presumably be capable of producing a third generation smarter than it mm -hmm. yet once once more and and that's the intelligence explosion. So once we have that, right? Once we have general AI that can produce something smarter than itself, this will presumably perpetuate it each round and go faster and faster. And that's why we talk about the intelligence explosion, uh, intelligence uh, explosion in this uh, in, in in this context. And and you know that is a that is a scary prospect. Uh, why is it scary? Though? It's a scary prospect because because there's then some interesting debate to be had about what the what the morality of pure intelligence would be. Yeah? So, um, um, or you know, more concretely speaking, uh, there's a, there's a, there's some speculation about what uh, pure intelligence like that would actually do with us and to us. And you know, some people have argued, and some movie makers have have put this into practice, right? That uh, as, a, as illustrations that uh, pure intelligence would be very eager to get rid of us because we are an obstacle to so many things. Uh, for example, uh, you know, we have brought climate change to the planet, right? We are, we are ruining the climate for all other species. And yeah. so uh, that's why one might be worried. Uh, you know, general intelligence might, might say the planet as a whole, including it, the, the general intelligence, is better off if we don't exist. Right? So that's the that's the worry that that uh, that artificial general the general artificial intelligence 
will do something with the planet that is not going to work out well for us. Mm -hmm. But is that not determined about the designer, the engineer that designed this initially? Mm -hmm. Will be you know they'll be measuring some sort of things mm -hmm. for it to improve on. Mm -hmm. There'll be metrics. Mm -hmm. So if the engineers design metrics that says if there's obstacles in your way of you know improvement or mm. overall improvement in a situation or setting, mm. then this case would you know probably happen maybe in the next fifty six years. But if they design it well enough and very strategically, do you still think this could be a reality? Well, so certainly uh, I do not think that the solution, uh, that's something that we can rely on, will be that the initial engineering uh, it just has to be done the right way, right? Because what you, what, you have a, uh, what you have a machine learning is precisely something that goes beyond plain coding and programming where you basically give a lot of a long list of prescriptions so here's here's what the computer is supposed to do if this then that if that then mm -hmm. this right so but with machine learning what you have is you have an initial algorithm then you have certain data and the algorithm itself changes in response to the observation that it takes from the data so that's the mm -hmm. that's the the content of machine learning right mm -hmm. that the algorithm itself um, improves itself, right? So you, so you, th to that extent, of course, that is that is put into the machine genetics, right? The way it does uh, it does these improvements, but um, we see this in already in algorithms that are in circulation right now. That they often they do things, they learn in ways that are uh, not anticipated. Um, there was one very striking event a few years ago uh, when uh, one of uh, Deep Minds. Um, computers, um, I think it was AlphaGo, uh, and AlphaGo beat a very distinguished, uh, the most distinguished Go player in the world uh, by making a completely unexpected move, right? So uh, so this, this is not the kind of algorithm that just has um, computational capacities that looks at the situation as it is now on that Go field, and then it looks at the whole history of what has been done about this, you know, in the past, and then kind of selects the best. But mm -hmm. this is an algorithm that can, that has learned, but that by that time had learned so much that it can completely new, newly evaluate the whole strategic landscape, right? And that's exciting, right? So I mean, this this kind of move in the whole history of the game of Go had not been made. It deeply puzzled every expert. Uh, but it also tells you um, that uh, the predictability of what will happen when we have something like general and general artificial intelligence is somewhat limited. Mm -hmm. So the scope in which we're going is mm -hmm. in that direction. Potentially. Well, so so the, the this this question will there ever be a general artificial intelligence uh, or will there ever be an intelligence explosion explosion? Uh, is kind of dividing uh, the the field here a little bit. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of experts in the field, a lot of people who have been who have actually done uh, work in uh, the AI domain, are quite convinced that something like that is going to happen over uh, the next several decades. Mm -hmm. uh, which is why you know we should start thinking about it, start preparing ourselves, also start thinking about what the ethical and human rights implications are. Then, you know, then there's other people who say, um, you know, we have no particular reason to think that this will ever happen or in any event we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be worried about it now because we are, we are as of now nowhere near. Right? So engineering can't do that now. But if you, if you look at the pace of change these days, right, if you, you know, there was a time not very long ago when devices like this, you know, smartphones were um, almost unimaginable, right, that you can have a device that is connected to the internet that serves as a phone that provides audio music and has all sorts of additional gadget functions that this can all be, you know, lying in your palm like that and go with you wherever you go. You know, in 1995 was the subject of science fiction movies, right? Mm -hmm. and two, in 2005 still was that. And here we are. Yeah. The pace of change is picking up. Mm -hmm. I want to give a, a specific example. Mm -hmm. It's like, let's say self-driving cars, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. they code it in a way where it make, it's making probability probability decisions mm -hmm. based on the amount of risk each car is on the road and mm -hmm. to, to the car itself. Mm -hmm. So when these cars somehow malfunction or you know cause destruction or mm -hmm. maybe a death, 
who is responsible for this? Ah. Because this comes in your domain of yeah. who, who's responsible for the machine. Yeah. How, who can we hold accountable, though? Yeah, uh, you know, I uh, I don't have a I don't have a good answer to that. Uh, I mean, except for just acknowledging that this is a this is a very important question, and we need to have it. We need to have it. Uh, we need to figure it out before we are uh, before self-driving cars will be on the road in in, uh, in, in, in in larger groups, right? So because you have to you have to think of a division of responsibility between the people who are who are owning it so there's ownership dimension and responsibility and the people who have designed it there's a so some of this will need to be divided up in ways that are continuous with uh, uh with uh, with with what we already have uh while also doing justice to the particular features of this technology so this is this is something that i don't know terribly much about but i do know that at least uh, in the in the context of european union law there's a lot of intense thinking about that uh, to uh, create new legal instruments to to be prepared. For so that. when these governments are making mm. these decisions on mm. to allow certain you know, technologies to advance, mm. you know how do they make these decisions? Because they're not experts. They're ah, not yes. Maybe engineers. They're not yeah. very deep into this technology. Yeah. So how can we trust these governments to make the decisions? Well, so you know, there's uh, the way you put this now. Um, it's not uh, so there's a simplistic assumption that uh, you know technology gets developed only with the approval of governments of course that's it's really more the more the other way around right so technology develops uh, and technology development is often several generations ahead of uh, serious governmental reactions uh, to that uh, and so governments are uh, governments are governments really are not not even in the best kind of case uh, that much uh, ahead of the game that they would actually be seriously aware of what is going on in technology right now, and basically approve on the spot what should happen, what should you. Know. So there's a uh, there's a lot of initiative to the two industries, uh, and um, and you know this how this works out varies quite a bit across countries. So we, we were talking about China earlier. So in China, of course, um, the whole economy is uh, is 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 government driven, right? Mm -hmm. So the Chinese Communist Party has. In fact, has under uh, Xi Jinping, the, the the current president, who now is effectively president for life, um, has basically has increased its its reach in 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 all domains of the economy, and that means in China it is actually true that artificial intelligence is driven developed by governmental concerns. Um, in the United States, for example, this is very different, right? So under the current uh, administration, the United States is increasingly interested, uh, decreasingly interested, less and less interested in providing any kind of regulation. So it basically withdraws from regulation, leaving industries largely to their own devices more and more. And that creates a somewhat bizarre situation that uh, the world's most innovative tech industries, the you know American big tech companies, uh, basically uh, shouldering an enormous burden of responsibility right now because they are uh, they are they are not terribly much regulated mm -hmm. so yeah, that's surprising I would have assumed that mm. you know governments would be hand in hand and with because it's affecting mm -hmm. nearly every single person yes living mm -hmm. and yet there's mm -hmm. zero regulation I mean you you know you have to just think of that also just in a, on a, on a kind of from a kind of human standpoint so um, government is a bunch of people. Companies are a bunch of people. Um, the high-tech uh, companies, you know, think of think of places like uh, f Facebook, Microsoft, Google. Um, you know, places like that. I mean, these are these are enormously powerful companies populated by very sophisticated, uh, hard-driven, hard-charging, really smart people who are. Uh, who have an understanding of technology? That's what they do. Um, so there's there is there's all that in industry, and then you have in government um, a group of people who who have made careers as bureaucrats, as administrators, right? And of course, these, this is not the same type of person. Yeah. So if you are a super hotshot tech talent, which one would you rather work for, uh, the Trump administration or Mark Zuckerberg? Right. So chances are you're going to work work for Zuckerberg, and you know it's 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 this phenomenon that 
talent wants to design things and create things and wants to be in the private sector, of course, the pay is much higher. They also, um, you know, that makes it the case that governments are often just, um, I mean, literally several, several generations of tech development behind even comprehending what is going on in the, in the tech. But well, doesn't that suggest that we should change or opt, maybe refrain, uh, rearrange the way government is, you know, somehow done? because of this new age? Don't you think that there should be a different framework? Yeah, you know, it's a, a fair question. And, and some countries some countries do that, right? So uh, one, one country to think about here, I mean, for one thing, China, as I mentioned, does it differently, right? So yeah. in, China, in China, because of the state-controlled nature of all of the uh, e economy, including the digital economy, of course, you have also, uh, you has all, you, there's the, the Korean government uh, is also, of interest to uh, to a different kind of person than in other countries, right? Mm -hmm. So it's more attractive, and you know there's systematic grooming and recruitment for government purposes in China. Um, one other government that 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 uh, does something, I mean, importantly different from China, but is certainly also building itself as a government that is highly sophisticated and attracts talent and also pays them well is Singapore. So, you know, Singapore is committed to the smart city idea and, you know, integrating technology into all forms of city governments, but also to make sure that there is more of, a, uh, you know, harmony between how what industry does and what government does. And so in Singaporean government, you have, you know, on, on average, just the, the person working, at least for the for the higher echelons, there's a lot of sophistication. There's something about the particular story of Singapore that made that possible, right? But it's hard to export to other countries that don't have this kind of governance tradition. Mm -hmm. How about when governments use this technology against their own people? Let's say, you know, China with their rating system. Yeah. You know, how, can, how does it change? Because I was thinking about it, me and my friends were discussing, it's like, yeah. it will change the whole di social dynamic. Yeah. You know, your incentives will change. Yeah. The way you act, the way we, you know, have relationships would all, drastically changed yeah that's pretty scary uh, yeah it? that is pretty scary and uh, you know uh, <laughs> it's also quite remarkable uh, so the the development of China in China over the last decade you know, so um, let's say uh, seven eight years ago people many people working on China or at least a decent number of people working on China predicted that China would in the in the short or medium run basically go uh, lean more towards democracy for reasons that other countries have done in the past. Namely, there is a there is more economic growth, and that normally then means there is a strengthening middle class, and an economically empowered middle class is asking more for more of a share of political power. And so that seemed to indicate that China would be going more towards democracy, right? And and then various things happened, uh, and um, and now people are less optimistic that this would happen in China. So Xi Jinping turned out to be uh, a very astute party leader who has basically consolidated his own power within the party and the and the rule of the party within the country, but has also, as part of that, basically initiated a large scale effort uh, at developing a social scoring system, a surveillance, so mass surveillance by. Uh, by the government that w is completely unprecedented in history, that it would be a country of a population of upwards of 1.3 billion that would pioneer the kind of hardware, software, you know, design needed in order to gather and develop data over so of about so many people. But that that is where we are, and that is of course one of the also one of the bleak scenarios, um, you know, that is already upon us. So we talked about. You know uh, the possibility of an intelligence intelligence explosion that might not be benign toward human beings. That's on the radar somewhere. But what's already happening very much is governments using surveillance uh, on, on for for the sake of controlling the citizenry. So it's like a mass surveillance of the entire country. In China, that is what it is. And you know, if China can do it, other lots of other. It's just a question of time when lots of other countries will do that. Of course, it is always very much in the interest of governments to, to know what's going on with, uh, with its citizens. Uh, and especially authoritarian regimes uh, will, have, uh, you know, will have great interest in technology like that to, 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 to keep an eye on their citizenry. But what, to what degree 
world, you know, let's say more democratic countries, mm. let's say, you know, Australia, New Zealand, UK, America, because these are very libertarian countries that view the surveillance and privacy evasions as rather, you know, overstep. So, um, so surveillance, of course, can have uh, kind of good uses. Yeah? So, in if so, if we have a proper rule of law setting, where the kind of governmental surveillance that is done is properly ruled in, uh, reined in, um, then it can be put to good use. So, in the UK, for example, for a long time, uh, they 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 have used um, you know surveillance cameras of public spaces and. This is also happening in, in several of the other countries that you mentioned. And, um, you know, the, every once in a while you see reporting and, and quite often actually you see reporting on the news where it becomes clear that the only way in which uh, a certain, uh, you know, um, a certain culprit could be apprehended uh, is, uh, a certain suspect could be apprehended is by, is because there was surveillance in place, right? And so that's not per se problematic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with, so we, we just have we just have to make sense, like like with everything in the technology domain, um, you know, uh, technology is often morally neutral, can be used this way or that way. There's no reason, therefore, to stop it as such. But there needs to be it needs to be closely watched, uh, also by civil society and people like us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like surveying, you know, cameras and etc. These yeah. are very mild form of surveillance mm -hmm. but what about like at the different step of you know using some sort of ai to mm -hmm. keep track of all your messages mm -hmm. emails calls mm -hmm. and yes right now it's for good use maybe governments are using it you know to anti-terrorist radio all these things but yeah. could it somehow be used in another way well yeah of course i mean that the, it is being used already in other ways uh, very actively in china and uh, you know the Russians have made enormous strides uh, in that regard. So, uh, but it's not—it's not just happening. I mean, this is this is not just being done by governments. This is happening to you and I every day, right? Because yeah. because in addition to the governments, uh, there's also the private companies. So uh, so basically, all these things that you just mentioned, the kind of things that we do, uh, generate data, generate so anything anything that you do on on on, on a daily on, on any given day. Uh, that is electronically networked, yeah? and and that really means uh, you know if you are like me, the first thing you touch in the morning and the last thing you touch at night is some smart smartphone device, or if for no other reason than to check the time, right? mm -hmm. and uh, and that of course means at that moment you are electronically connected, and whoever is you know on the whoever is is uh, is is, um, is is providing. The software you are at that moment connecting to has, in principle, access to these da data, right? So, so in my case, Apple, you know, my my iPhone here. So, uh, Apple has data about me uh, that uh, give them a lot of information about my daily patterns, right? And and if you take the combination of these things, uh, so what I do with my smartphone, then a GPS in the car, you know, these various home devices like. Uh, thermostat devices, um, uh, Nest, you know, that's a company that makes uh, home thermostats. Alexa. Uh, Alexa, uh -huh. so the, those devices. Right? So any any kind of interaction with electronic devices and of course everything you do, you know, when, you, when you're explicitly online on your laptop or your, your, uh, your um, uh, you know, your, uh, your tablet, all, all of that, so anything you Google, of course, you know, mm -hmm. so, so basically the metadata generated about you, um, you know, allow, com you know, if that, if that, 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 that amount of data, so these data are produced by a lot of, uh, by a lot of people relevantly like you, you know, mm -hmm. your age group, your, you know, the, the people who do the kind of things that you do. So overall, there's so much, so, so many, so, so, so such an overall pool of data about people like you that based on that companies can make prediction what your favorite book is what your favorite thing to eat is what your favorite travel destination is and and this phenomenon that uh, surveillance has become crucial for the way the uh, the digital economy is working was recently discussed in a fascinating book by Shoshana Zuboff called surveillance capitalism mm -hmm. so she also coined that term surveillance capitalism to indicate that 
for the current form of capitalism, surveillance of this sort is so crucial that it should give this whole era of capitalism its name, namely surveillance mm -hmm. capitalism. So in terms of ethics and mm. more, you know, the morality mm. of this type of surveillance, mm. you know, is it ethical? It's deeply problematic. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and it's deeply problematic because it basically means you know, there's, the, there's this fascinating term, uh, commodification, that originally comes from a, from a Marxist uh, left-wing social theory standpoint, right? So commodification is a term used to describe that ever more things are traded on the market, so ever more things have a price. That's how they become commodities and become commodified. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a problem if, if too many things, uh, you know, that, sh that should have a value of a different kind rather than a market price are, are commodified. And basically what's happening right now is that all our, our lives, so human lives overall, uh, become commodified in this way. So all of reality is becoming commodified because everything we do, uh, and that is uh, electronically connected, serves as data points uh, or in principle serves as data points for companies uh, for their for their business model yeah, that's like pretty interesting how yeah. the whole world has evolved yeah. so like right now uh, you're teaching class called the meaning of life mm -hmm. so you know in this day and age where the way we act the way we you know the way we do things have drastically changed from 20 years ago from when our parents were alive and mm -hmm. you know working you know, how does one question, you know, what is the meaning of life today? And like, how can we form those questions or what questions should we ask? Well, um, so in, in that particular regard, as, as far as meaning of life is concerned, I don't think the world has changed uh, is, is so dramatically different now than it was 25 years ago. So the, uh, the kind of question, uh, so, so for, first of all, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people find this mildly funny, right? If you, if, uh, you know, uh, you say, well, it's a class on the meaning of life going on, right? So yeah. there's certain, certain movies. From the outset, it's very, it's like, uh, you know, interesting. It looks very different. Yeah, no, yeah. Th thank you for saying that. So <laughs> I've had a lot of interesting encounters with people who are around that. I've gotten a lot of incredul incredulous stares, you know, from people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and, I mean, it's, to some extent, a generational thing, right? There's a, there's a, there's a Monty Python movie from the 80s called The Meaning of Life, which is kind of a, co a comedian's take on the theme. And... <laughs> Uh, you know, if you are into the science science fiction classics, there is a uh, book called Hitchhikers to the Galaxy, if, you know, uh, oh, yeah. Douglas Adams from the late 70s, mm -hmm. right, where, uh, you know, everybody who is familiar with that genre knows that the meaning of life uh, is 42. Uh, why is it 42? Well, because some complicated question was developed that, uh, you know, that, that somehow was getting at the m what, you know, the meaning of life was. and. And the way it had to be put to the computer, the answer to that was 42. But to make sense of that, now you have to remember what and nobody remembers what the question was because it took the computer so long to figure that out, right? So that's a, um, so what what are we doing if if we are not doing that kind of thing? Uh, well, we are we are asking, you know, we everybody understands that life, uh, if 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 nothing else, is a, is a biological phenomenon, right? So we are uh, a certain kind of organism. Uh, certain kind of biological entities, so there's lots of biological facts uh, about us, uh, and so we are in a way a part of nature. Uh, and as you're asking about uh, meaning of life, you're asking whether there's any kind of significance to us as, you know, biological facts that mm. beyond these biological yeah. facts. Right? Is there, is there, is there something about us either in relation to some external entity or? something that we, that we can make of our lives that creates a kind of personal significance. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the question of the meaning of life. And um, religions have a strong record of giving answers to that kind of question that have made sense to a lot of people. Right? There was a, uh, the, the personal significance, the kind of pointing beyond the biological facts that are constitutive of, of life, um, that, that, that kind of pointing beyond was done by way of reference to a divine figure. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an answer that has and continues to work for a lot of people. Uh, it does not work for a lot of other people these days who, you know, are not confident um, th that there is such a divinity or even if there were that it is the right way connected to us. And so you, you look elsewhere for what 
personal significance uh, could be. Uh, but, you know, these questions by themselves are not changing quite as quickly as the, you know, as the, uh, I mean, these are very fundamental human questions that are kind of lingering with us uh, more enduringly than, you know, than, than the state of technology. I mean, that changes a lot faster. <laughs> so, you know, you did say, like, mm -hmm. relatively, like, you know, we are biological beings, mm -hmm. you know, but to someone that, you know, wants to find a larger meaning of life, biological beings and just being, a, you know, dust of atom, a carbon atoms mm -hmm. is not very, like, inspiring or, you know, it doesn't... So what I'm trying to say is, like, how can someone just frame themselves as just biological beings? Mm -hmm. Don't you think that we need a higher, dare I say, like a purpose or some, some sort of motivation or incentive to you know go about our days and explore new ideas and do new things yeah so the the motivation for this question about the mm. meaning of life was was just to say you know at the what we what what we what we are as human beings just you know as a, as part of nature is you know we are a certain kind of organism we are uh, you know there are certain biological facts about us we have a body and we have a brain and all that right and mm -hmm. so um, and and you know you, you're right. I mean, then uh, then this brain generates certain questions, right? And we want to know, you know, are we just part of nature the way a palm tree is, or a bit of grass is, or maybe something totally unorganic is, right? Mm. Or is there is there something beyond us? Is there something beyond that that gives us, you know, could be a purpose, or uh, you know, so, something? So the question about significance is always so some kind of relation to something outside of us, yeah, so that we that we find relevance in in that. Yeah. So do you think that most people that study this topic mm. often come down to that conclusion that human beings need that some sort of connection to that higher purpose or yeah, so something outside that, that, of themselves. So religion has a strong record of, of answering that question. Right? Yeah. So I mean this this is why religion has been uh, has been attractive uh, to people. So religion provides. Um, so, so one way of motivating what religion does is: so if you if you are a finite biological creature, it's something where you know it's a finite finite lifetime and a finite size to your body. You kind of wonder, what am I? Is there is there a personal significance that I have because I'm connecting to things around me and. Uh, and then you can say, oh, you know, you, you are connecting to things around you because you matter to people around you, you can make contributions to their lives, so you can help with this and, you know, help with that. But then you kind of ask, well, but what is their significance, right? So for finer things, you can always keep asking mm -hmm. such questions. And what's different about religion is religion has this ability to talk about the infinity of God. You know? So you as a finite being can relate to this other kind of entity that is infinite and you can kind of lean against that other entity. Um, and about that other entity, because it's infinite, this kind of question doesn't arise any any further, right? As it would arise for other finite things. Yeah. And so that's uh, that's that's one that's one way of thinking about how religion has created this this purpose, right? This external purpose that there's yeah. this infinite entity that you're connected to. But you know, of course, that that depends on the the viability of that answer. Is that you find uh, yourself persuaded of the evidence given for uh, the religious framework, right? And yeah. and and a lot of people are not persuaded of that. And there's one whole line of. Uh, thinking known as existentialism that goes a completely different way there, right? And says there is, as you're asking about personal significance, don't count on anything that's externally given, right? Certainly not, um, you know, any kind of divinity. It's just uh, not enough, not enough, uh, not enough grounding, not enough reason to think that, that, that we have that, um, that we can count on that. So existentialist, and these would be people like Albert Camus and uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. Sartre is probably the, the best known one, uh, French French thinkers. Um, um, so Sartre had, had famously had the slogan, the, the existence precedes the essence. Yeah? So, so we are kind of a naked existence. So initially, we really just are this biological thing, you know, biological organism. And then uh, and in our case as human beings, you know, we have we have then uh, we are a particular kind of biological thing, namely with a very sophisticated brain. Uh, so existence precedes the essence. So what we can basically do is we can 
invent our own relevance, right? We make choices and thereby we define ourselves as a certain kind of being. Uh, and existentialism proposes to us something that by traditional religious standards would sound as, would, would seem completely outrageous and ridiculous and undefensible and sacrilegious, namely uh, to consider life a completely open story, uh, a tabula rasa, where you really are telling your own narrative by making your own choices and thereby putting yourself somewhere in the world and developing that, that significance um, by yourself. So what do you think that shifted? Well, I don't even know if it shifted between, mm -hmm. you know, everyone, not every, everyone, but most people believing in religion and mm -hmm. now many people, I, I think I saw the stats in a lot of uh, developed countries, mm -hmm. the, you know, increasing number of people not believing or, you know, traditional religions has mm -hmm. drastically increased. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the maybe reason to that or is there even... Uh, logical reason. Well, so um, one one person one tends to read in a in a in a class called the meaning of life or you know anything concerned also with existentialism and its uh, predecessors is uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, 19th century German philosopher, died in 1900 in fact, uh, and so Nietzsche is uh, famous for a uh, for among other things the, the formulation of the death of God. Uh, so the death of God um, and um, what's so intriguing about that formulation, um, which by the way is uh, not entirely original with Nietzsche, but was kind of circling around in the in the 19th century. Uh, but what's, what's intriguing about the formulation, the death of God, is that um, you are not thereby simply saying that God does not exist. You are saying there was a death, right? God died, and that means God was once alive, right? So. And then you wonder, what could that mean? I mean, if God was ever alive, the kind of being that he or she or they were presumably could not die, right? So what would this even mean that, that God died? Um, and the, the interpretation of that phrase is, uh, well, what's been happening is uh, humanity went through different stages of thinking, um, scientific development, and also reflection about who we are in the world. And, uh, and for a certain period of time, um, thinking about a divinity, a god or gods, was the best explanation that we had, right? And then science made more progress, thinking made more progress, uh, and eventually, um, and eventually, a lot of things could be explained without God that traditionally had required a kind of religious uh, reference, right? And so that's that's one. So the death of God theme that basically. Uh, the belief in God has become somewhat superfluous, unnecessary. Um, I think that uh, that drives a lot of the loss of religiosity in the world. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting how you know these you know philosoph philosophical discussions have mm -hmm. led to you know different parts in the world. Mm -hmm. Pretty, it's pretty cool. But again, thank you very much for coming on the show. Um, I really appreciated this conversation. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. and, you know, thank you again. Mm -hmm. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>